what a delight it is to be with you this evening. And I'm just so excited that the Lord has given me this opportunity. And I'll not add to what Reverend has shared about me, uh, just to save time. But anyway, just to add a little more, uh, I'm a single and I've loved the Lord and have not regretted why I've remained like this because it's the Lord's desire for me. And I think right from the beginning, um, when I was on campus, there is a time when um, somebody came to, to speak to us in the fellowship. And he was talking about serving the Lord. And that time I was in my final year. And when he, he asked us in the fellowship, how many of you love the Lord in, in the fellowship? We all put up our hands and we said, yes, we love the Lord. And then he went on to ask, how many of you are ready? I don't mean we all put up our hands. So he went around the circle and he started asking each one of us, when do you want to serve the Lord? When do you want to serve the Lord? You know, all of us were saying, after we get a good job, after we get married, after we get children, after we get lots of money, after, 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 after. So this guy said, oh, okay, you all said you are ready to serve the Lord, but from what I'm hearing, you all want to serve after. And then he asked another question. He said, how many of you ladies will want to serve leftover food to your best friends? You know that time when Mary Stewart Hall, and we thought, mm, no, you cannot serve anything less to your best friend. You have to serve the very best. So then he connected the two. And he said, you have all said you are going to serve the Lord, but it is after and after. And you have also said you love the Lord. And you have said you don't want to give leftovers to your best friend. So what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> and so he said, when we say we'll serve after, it means we want to give leftovers to the Lord. You know, that thing touched me. It was a simple thing, but it touched my heart. And I thought, no, God, I don't want to give you leftovers of my life. I want to give you the prime of my life, the best of my life. I don't understand what I'm committing myself to, but I want to give the very best of my life to you. And that was the turning point for me. And that was my commitment to God, to give the very best without reservation. And so that is part of the history of why I am like this. And I just say, God, I want to give you the very best of my life, the very best of myself. And whatever you want to do with me, do it the way you want. And I'm content with what God has done in my life. All right, so let's pray as we come to our topic this evening. Dear Father, we do thank you. Thank you that you are indeed God. You are almighty. You have the very best plans for each one of us, and you are interested in every detail of our lives. Father, this evening, as we share your word, may you overshadow us with your spirit. Stir up our hearts, Lord, with that which is dear to your heart. Father, speak through me. Use these words to direct your people. Use these words to draw them to what you want them to be and to do, that your name will be honored and glorified. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So this day has been a day of talking about building effective altars. We started in the morning by building effective personal altars. Then we went into family altars. 
And this evening, we want to start with building effective community altars. And I want to borrow a little bit from this morning about what an altar is. And I picked one phrase. What is an altar? And I think what I picked, and I want to narrow down my sharing too, is an altar is a place of slaughter and sacrifice. It is a place of slaughter. You know where animals are slaughtered? And it is a place of sacrifice. But on the other hand, it is also a power point to draw spiritual and supernatural strength. For example, that's what happened in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. At the same time, an altar is a place of separation. It's a place where we choose to separate ourselves unto the Lord. And so when you come to a place where you separate yourself unto the Lord, it means you are dedicating that time, that life to the Lord. And I went further to find out that also an altar is a place where we meet with God in worship. It's a place where we meet with God in worship. And it's also a place where God chooses to reveal himself to his people. Because when we seek him, we find him. And then it's also a place where God makes covenant with his people. Because God is a covenant keeping God. He's a covenant making God. And then lastly, it is a place where we remember what God has done. So where there is remembrance of an experience with God, I know there's always a sign, there's always an altar that we build. And so throughout the scriptures, altars appear, but in different forms. An altar is not something very new. And sometimes our understanding or perception of altars may lead us to think, oh, altars may be <laughs> dedicated to spirits. Spirits, be it a holy spirit or evil spirit. That may be a perception. But throughout the Bible, altars take different forms. For example, altar can be a place of encounter with God. And when you encounter God, that means you have a personal experience with God. And then as you encounter God and you have experience, you also have a moment of revelation. For example, in Genesis 28, Jacob met the Lord during a crisis. You know, he was going into Bethel. So on the way, his, the, the day kind of got him. So he chose to sleep. And so as he slept, he had a beautiful encounter with the Lord. And when he woke up from that place, you know, something stirred up in him. And then he said, surely God is in this place. I was, and he wasn't even aware of it. He said, I wasn't aware of it. And then he became afraid. He became afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And so that was a personal encounter with God. And God revealed himself to Jacob in such a way that Jacob could not fail to recognize the uniqueness of what God was and who God was. 
So he had an unforgettable experience with God. And I believe each one of us may have had unforgettable experiences that we have had with God. And if I were to go around, I believe you all have testimonies of those moments of experiences. And altars are also a place of worship. And when you encounter God, there's no way you'll not worship God. There's no way where you'll not say, God, you are good. God, you are great. God, you are awesome. God, you have done this. You remember the goodness of God. So altars become a place of worship. And we saw a lot of that during the lunchtime uh, session. And then thirdly, altars are also a place of covenant, as I shared before. And we see that a lot when Abraham and God made a first agreement. And from that point, you know, the land that was sealed has, has become a timeless experience. So God uses all these forms of altars to cause us to come into that remembrance of who he is. And then the altars can also be places of forgiveness. And the ultimate altar is the cross of Calvary. Is the cross of Calvary. And that's the place where there was divine exchange. That's where God exchanged for us our sinfulness, our hopelessness, our state of affairs, and he gave us new life. He gave us new identity. So that to us is the ultimate place of forgiveness. So that's a little bit of what altars are. And then altars can also be places of intercession. And many times we draw to uh, times of intercession. We draw to pray on behalf of others. For example, Joel the prophet called for intercession. He invited the leaders to come along so that they can pray. And then lastly, I wanted to observe this, that altars are places where there is a price to pay. There is a price to pay. And when God intends to do something, he will have to alter your life. <laughs> a life that is at the altar is an altered life. It can never be the same life again. Once you come to the altar, your life is an altered life. So, as you come to the altar, there are things that God will begin to change in your life. There are things that will, God will begin to alter around in your life. Maybe your desires, maybe your dreams, maybe your aspirations. God will begin to change that when you are at the altar. And one person commented that, you know, when altars were being built, they were built from broken stones. They were not from whole stones, but the stones had to be broken. And then they were put together and built together. And so even in our own personal lives, maybe there have been some broken pieces of your life. Maybe in your family there have been situations where there are broken pieces. Or in the nation, there are broken pieces. But, you know, these broken pieces in God's hand can form something new. So when you begin to think about altered life, you bring those broken pieces. And you surrender it to the Lord. And God begins to build what is broken and he puts it together so that what comes out of it is something that is glorious, something that will be remembered, something that will be admired, something that will be steadfast and for his glory. So altered lives at the altar 
are altered lives. And there is a price that has to be paid. Now, when coming to our theme this afternoon, establishing community altars, I was looking at the scripture that was given to us, which is Nehemiah chapter, one, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 12. So I may not read it out, but you can turn there. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 12. But as we look at the scripture, I want to concentrate on just three points so that we have time left to pray. So I looked at the essentials of establishing the community altar and how effective it can be. So through these scriptures, I realized one thing. The first thing is the individual life, which I've actually explained. So before you form a community altar, it has to start with an individual. You have to start with the individual. But the individual life, that must be surrendered. Individual life, that must be given to the Lord. Individual life, that should be desirous of obedience to the Lord. And a life that is ready to pay the cost. A life that is full of discipline. You cannot be in discipline and yet come to the altar. No. Coming to the altar, coming to an encounter with God requires discipline. And discipline in the word, discipline in prayer. Because these two are the foundations or fundamentals of effectiveness. Discipline in prayer and discipline in the word. So the first thing is the person or the individual and that individual's life. Then two, we need to have a sense of inadequacy. A sense of inadequacy, in other words, realizing that in yourself you cannot do it. And that drives you to the dependence on God. So dependence on God as you look at your own inadequacy. I just want us to turn to Ezra chapter 8 verse 21. Ezra chapter 8 verse 21. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. That is a point where Ezra expressed, you know, a sense of inadequacy. And Ezra then gathered all the people. You know, he gathered the people. And there by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king the gracious hand of God is on everyone who looks to him. But his great anger against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So 
there is the aspect of realizing that you are not adequate in yourself, so you seek God's guidance. And also like Joel, he also realized that there needed to be support for him when he was declaring a time of fasting. So in Joel chapter 1, he also called the leaders so that they could come and pray and intercede because of what was happening in the country. And so Joel asked for support. And that support was to help him and the people to pray. And so in our lives, there are moments when we need support in prayer. And so when you are looking at your own life, when you are looking at the family, when you are looking at the community, are there people whom you can call and say, come, let's pray together for this issue? Because for Joel, he realized how the economy was devastated, how the locusts had eaten, and how people were hungry. But there was hope because his hope was in the Lord and what God could do. So he, he called the leaders and the priests, and they had a time of prayer. So even this morning, uh, this evening, when you are looking at your village, when you are looking at your community, when you are looking at your family, who are you going to call as a support for prayer? Because you cannot do this by yourself. There are moments we need the help of other people. So the individual is the first thing in altered life. Secondly, we need a sense of dependence on God, realizing how inadequate that we are. And then the third thing in helping us to establish community altars which are effective is a burden. We must have burden. You cannot begin to intercede when there is no burden. Because when there's a burden, then it draws you to keep consistent. But where there's no burden, you know you can pray one, two times, and it is gone. But where there is a burden, it keeps you consistent in prayer. It keeps you consistent to seeking God. It keeps you consistent in knocking and knocking until you see the answers. Let's just have a look at what is happening today in families. It's a time of families, you know, family at the crossroad. When we look at our families, when we hear stories of families, what are those themes, what are those headlines in the families? You know, we, we see a lot of separation and we see a lot of uh, divorce. In Africa, divorce and separation used to be, what can I say? It used to be um, very foreign. You know, when you marry, you marry, you marry. But these days, marriage is becoming like a test piece. We are seeing the rate of divorce rising, even in Uganda. Why is that so? Does it burden your heart to see young families broken? Does it burden your heart to see people separated? And we do not, do not only see that. We see children who are addicted children under the influence of alcohol, children under the influence of drugs. There's a lot of drug abuse. There's a lot of substance abuse. In the families we see incest. These are not stories. These are realities. We see a lot of 
teenage pregnancies. We see a lot of immorality and our moral fiber in the country is breaking. We see a lot of domestic violence. There are so many stories about that. And we see, even in families, there's competition, there's envy, there's hatred, there's unforgiveness. All these things are happening. You look at the clans, what's happening in the clans? There's a lot of unforgiveness. There's a lot of talk about hidden anger. There's a lot of talk about discrimination. There's a lot of talk about injustice. All these things are happening. And we look at the nation, the bribery, the corruption, that's always a song. But we pray that one day this song will change. And we pray that one day we'll say, this is a nation that fears the Lord. And God is able to. And as God lays these burdens on our hearts, it should draw us. So does what we see put a burden in your heart? Does what you see in your family put a burden in your heart? Does it bring tears to your eyes? How do you see families? Do you weep or do you laugh? Do you cry to God or you end up complaining May what we see, may what we hear, bring that passion in our hearts to cry back to God. May God burden our hearts with the things that burden him. And when there's a burden, there is always the way that we are going to persist in prayer because God's burden cannot be removed unless he removes that himself as he answers. Then lastly, there is a place for the word of God. So effectiveness in establishing a community altar depends on the effectiveness that we will have in reading and meditating on the word. When I was growing up, one of the things that I learned was prayers prayed according to the word of God will always be answered. Why? Because God cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself. And God's word is true. He cannot deny himself and he cannot deny his word. So how I pray that as we read the word, there'll be that reaction from us. Does the word of God cause you to worship him? Does the knowledge that God brings to us through his word cause us to lift up our hands in worship and praise does the word of God cause us to recognize where we are at? Because that's exactly what happened. And you know, it is amazing that these people read. And when they, they, they listened, Ezra read for six hours, from morning up to noon. How many of us could sit, just sit when the word is being read? And these days, you know, when we come to service, when it's about 10 minutes, what do we do? We're already <laughs> looking at the watch. But six hours, and they were very, very attentive. Very, very attentive. Because there's something that the word does to us. There's something, when you draw near to God in his word, he can catch your attention. 
how I pray that we shall go back to reading the word. You know, it's, it's not uncommon that we begin just to, to quote. Like I can, I can quote my, my sister and say, this is what the pastor said. And this is what the pastor said. This is the pastor's word. But where is the word of God? Why are we fond of quoting a pastor, maybe somebody who is speaking very well? We catch a phrase and we say, this is what so-and-so said. Why isn't the word of God so familiar to us that we quote it even in our conversation? Why is that missing in us? May the Lord continue to burden our hearts to go back to his word so that his word becomes the expression of our hearts. And as we come to the altar, there's no way you can pray fervently without the knowledge of God's word. So my prayer is, May the Lord draw us to that place of studying his word, of meditating on his word, of loving his word, and expressing his word. And not only that, when these people heard of the things that have been read, you know, there were others who helped Ezra. There were leaders who were helping Ezra. And they were standing, for example, verse 5. No, verse 7. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Serebiah, Jamim, Akub, Shabeth, okay, all those names. Um, they instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. So apart from Ezra reading, there were people who were explaining. And so in the community, as we begin to pray. There are moments when we need to have understanding of the word so that the word begins to do the conviction. And when God convicts people through his word, it is an unforgettable experience. And lastly, the people were weeping. You know, they were sad because the word showed them their sin. And even as they began to weep for their sin, then Ezra and Nehemiah had to come and comfort the people and said, this is not a time for weeping, but this is the time to rejoice. This is the time to enjoy. Now the people should go back and go and drink. And not only that, but they should go and share with those who don't have. So you see the transformation coming from receiving the word. The people became sensitive to the needs of others so that what they have will be shared. So even as we think about the community, what are people in your community lacking? What things are the people in your community in need of? You know, some may be in need of food. Some may be in need of just your time. But how many of us are giving time to people in our community? And how many of us may say, okay, we are going to leave this in the hands of the pastors or the clergy. That is their role. But when God causes us to come to him, there are times when we have to surrender. There are times when we look beyond ourselves to what God is showing us. 
So just like Nehemiah and Jeremiah told the people, no, do not grieve. This is a sacred one to the Lord. This is a sacred day to the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I pray that as we look in our community, the Lord will lay something in our hearts. The Lord will lay something in your heart today. Maybe time to spend with your neighbors, time to spend with your family, and time to spend with others. It's so easy these days to be in locked places. We have built walls around ourselves, physical walls and okay, perimeter walls and walls that we put um, mentally. But I pray that God will help us to break forth from these walls and we go beyond ourselves to share the good news, to share with those in need. Somebody may just want a listening ear. Will you be available? And somebody may want a time for you to pray with. Will you be available? So as the children of Israel had an experience and the word of God altered their lives, I pray that the word of God will alter your life enough for you to break out from your perimeter wall and reach out to the next one. We don't have to go very far. We just begin to start from where we are. So establishing community altars effectively will mean learning to be sensitive to the needs of others. Because when you are locked up, how will you sense the need of others? When you are locked up and you are closed up, how will you know what another one is suffering from? It's not enough just to hear, but many times we need to go beyond and see. So may the Lord give us his eyes. May the Lord give us his compassion to the lost world. Because when we are praying for the community, when we are establishing altars in the community, it's the moment to draw near to God with the burden that he has laid on our hearts. And remember, it's a changed person who will <laughs> go with another changed person. So within the community, you can identify people who are like-minded and come together as an entity so that you begin to seek the Lord. And I just want to give you an example of what the Lord has done in our life village. You know, we call it life village, but it's somewhere in Chikaya. And we said we don't want that name Chikaya because it has a negative connotation. So instead of Chikaya, we call it life village. And we are a number of life ministry staff who live there together. And every Tuesday, we, we come together and we pray at Dr. Simway's place. We are all neighbors. And one of the things the Lord put to us is to ask for a good, organized neighborhood. And when we came there at first, it was a place that had lots of confusion. The roads were not tarmacked, and many things were missed. We had many thieves in that area, even witch doctors and so on. So when we started at that altar, every time before we start, Dr. Asimwe will ask, what do you see? What do you hear in the village? What are you trusting God for? And so we listed so many things, like organized village, no rubbish throwing, children being, <laughs> behaving well, and we are praying out, you know, um, against addictions and all that. 
And we wanted also good roads. And that time our road was really dusty. But down the years, when you go to Chikaya, many things have changed. The roads are tarmacked. We even have uh, the lights there, street lights there. And there are places we call, okay, city square. I mean, there's a lot of development in there. And uh, another thing was, there were witch doctors there. But as we prayed, they have left the place. And that is just the impact of prayer when people come together. And now they are developing more of those areas. We have now supermarkets. There's a mall being built there. So it's like God is opening a lot of things. But the truth was, once we joined together in prayer, God started answering in many ways. And now we are praying against places of drinking because there are many springing out there. And I pray that we will see the impact of concerted prayer as people come together with a burden. So may the Lord bless us this evening as we begin to think of what we see so that we don't remain in seeing, but we get involved. May you be the answer to the prayers that you pray. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we do thank you. Even as we come before you, you see our hearts. You see the needs around. You see the cries of people. Lord, devastations around us. Places where people are hopeless. Places, Lord, where we see children addicted. Children under influence of substance abuse. Families that have been shattered. Lord, moral decadence eating the fibers of our society that will uphold us together. Families separated. Divorce rates very high. Child abuse. Our Father and our God, we can only come back to you. Father, how I pray that these things that I concern to you the love that you have for your people. May you give us your eyes. May you give us your love and compassion for the world around us. That will not be like the salt that is in a shaker, but will be shaken out of that soul, uh, the shaker into the community that the lives will be touched. Lives, Lord our God, will be restored to you. I pray, our Father, that you will grow a desire in each of us to be acquainted with your word, that your word will become the expression of our hearts moment by moment. Father, how I pray that we will cherish your word because your word is life transforming. Your word, O oh Lord, is life giving. Father, I pray that our lives at the altar will be altered lives because you are present. O oh Lord our God, work your ways in our lives and make us the kind of people who will bring your love in a very practical way. May we be channels of your love. May we be channels of your word. And may we, O oh Lord our God, be instruments in your hand 
that you'll use for your glory till we see transformation to the honor and glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we give a mighty clap to the Lord? And thank you, Dr. Joyce. Can we give a round of applause to Dr. Joyce? Thank you, Dr. Joyce. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Provost, and everyone who's here. And those online, you're welcome. And um, those who joined late, the topic uh, Dr. Joyce Kule was dealing with establishing effective community altars. And we were dealing with Nehemiah 8, 1 to 12. Um, one of the things I want to pick up is that it begins with an individual. Dr. Joyce gave a testimony why she's single. All singles in the house and those online, hallelujah, effective community altars. Uh, doctor talked about individual. First of all, it must begin with you. And she talked about personal uh, burden. That's where I want to begin from. It begins with you. Do you have a personal altar? And we dealt with it in the morning, if you are not online. And if you have an altar, then you, it is important that we, you, you use it effectively. You can have an altar, but is it effective? Because I think the catch word here is establishing effective. I want to deal with the word effective because many people have altars, but sometimes we don't service them. Sometimes we... Let's pray. Our God and our Father, thank you for your servant, Dr. Kule, as she dealt with this. We pray that, Lord, you help us to establish, first of all, personal altars, and then, Lord, before we come to the community altars. We pray for everyone who has attended this meeting here in the cathedral and online, that, Lord, you begin with us. Begin with us as we deal with ourselves to know that an altar is a place of worship, is a place that we can commune with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. As she said, uh, individual altars, she brought out points which we must be attended to. An altar is a place of intercession where you deal with intercession for others and for yourself, for the nation and for the church. She also said it's a place of forgiveness. And because we are dealing with a family at crossroads, that's our major theme as the Banner State, it's a place of forgiveness. Forgiveness runs across from parents to children to workers to everybody. An altar is where you pay a price. That one was doom. You must pay a price when you establish an altar. Either there is, there is a team no sleep, you, because you cannot establish an altar and then you don't service it. You must make time to worship at that altar. Sometimes going longer without sleep, sometimes fasting, sometimes just waiting on the Lord. So let's pray that the Lord helps us to, uh, to raise up effective altars. Our God and our Father, we thank you that your servant has told us that altars is a place of forgiveness. Father God, first of all, we want to forgive. We want to pray for ourselves. If there is anybody that I have not forgiven, Lord, remind me that tonight we choose to forgive. We choose to forgive those who have hurt us when we are young, hurt us at home, hurt us at work, hurt us during ministry time, where there have been accusations, where there have been exchange of words. We also choose to forgive those who are just careless with whatever concerns altars. Sometimes we see the issue of discreting the altars by us ourselves in a community altar. Sometimes it's here at church when we don't deal with the sanctuary properly. Lord, we choose to forgive. Sometimes it's dealing with Levites. As your servant read, the Levites were there when Ezra was reading. 
And sometimes we have carelessly dealt with these people who explain the law to us. So we choose to forgive those who have done that. And we choose to forgive ourselves for being hard-hearted at certain times. Thank you, our God and our Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Dr. Joyce said that altars are built on broken stones. And broken stones is where the Lord repairs. What is broken in you? Is it your prayer life? Is it um, your, your marriage which is breaking? Is it the children who are breaking? All this we bring to the community altars. So in, build, in building to that point, let's pray for the children. Let's pray for marriages because the issue is the family. Let's pray for the extended family. Let's pray for these two years where COVID ravaged. Um, on Sunday, the preacher, Mr. David, told us that no, COVID just exposed what that we had, not that COVID was the cause. So I, I reflected as he talked about it and said, yes, we were hiding these things, and we kept on saying, GBV, 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 and we don't say what is happening. So when COVID ravaged, we saw all child abuse, we saw battering, we saw many things. So let's bring repentance over these issues and say, Lord, I am a broken stone, so repair me, repair my children. Amen? Father God, all us us uh, established on broken stones. And Lord, we have broken marriages. Lord, may you repair broken marriages. We have broken marriages because of money, because of lack of communication, because of small things that, Lord, are easily to be rubbished. But Father God, from the sharing on Sunday, from where the, 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 um, Dr. Jocelyn and God shared about trauma. Lord, all this bring broken stones. And so, Lord, repair us. Repair marriages. Repair children who are on drugs. Repair children who are rebellious. Repair children who are just not good-mannered, ill-mannered, who answer elders. Repair us who, are, who answer the Levites. Repair us because we do not want to pray. We look at our watches when there is a preacher. We don't want to listen we want to be prayed for, and we don't want to pay sacrifice. Repair us, O oh Lord. Father God, we thank you for this time and this week. We pray that, Lord, you discipline us, O oh Lord. Thank you, our Lord and our God. In Jesus' name we pray. She talked about starting with discipline of the word and prayer, and that is very important, reading the word. I, I had a time, I, I think... I've just been burdened for myself. There was a time the Lord gave me to wake up every day at 5 a.m. And I would just get to my balcony and read the word loudly, a chapter a day, and I would read loudly and just go back inside and sit. Every day it, it went for a time and I just enjoyed it. But I've, I lost it, so there's something broken. I was wondering what happened to this time. I just got to that instruction, but... And this sends us back to Bible study and reading the word of the Lord. Because every time we read the word of the Lord, we realize our inadequacies, as she said. We realize that we have a task to do. And so reading the word and memorizing it. So let's pray and we also invite people to read the word individually. Because uh, as doctors referred to our chapter, Ezra read the word loudly. So sometimes even when you don't want to pray, it's just good that you read the word to yourself and it just sinks. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we pray for ourselves that we shall read the word loudly. And when we read, we shall pray. Lord, give us a disciplined life. Help us, O oh Lord, to understand that reading your word is part of our life daily. It's a it's a lifestyle that we cannot avoid, O oh Lord. We pray for ourselves that, Lord, we shall read this word every day. Read it for our people. Read it for our children. Bind it on the wrists. Put it on the foreheads. And, O oh Lord, like Joshua said, 
we shall teach our children. Thank you, our Lord and our God. In Jesus' name, we pray. The other thing is realizing our weakness. Ezra, as we referred when they were moving, he called the people. He had already told the king, uh, 8, 21, 23, Ezra, chapter 8, that the Lord was going to protect them. Have you been to a situation where you are sure people that God is going to protect, but you are fearful, even as say, ha, supposing this. I think Ezra had reached there. Let's, let's pray that we shall rely on the Lord, not on human beings. Because Ezra said, I will not ask the king. Let's ask God. Our God and our Father, I'm reminded that we have a GM on Saturday. Lord, we are inadequate. I want to pray, Lord, that at this time when we are praying about family, we also pray for the family at all saints. As we go to the AGM, Lord, we pray that this is not a time of backlash, of accusation, of roasting the provost, of roasting the, the, the clergy or, or anything, but it's a time of communion with the Lord and helping ourselves to, and to plan what we are going to do uh, to achieve our strategic plan. I pray that this season, O oh Lord, it will be joy that we shall be coming back together. It's a time that we have missed being together in an AGM. And we pray that there will be many people. We summon the community of all saints and all those that we shall come, like Ezra summoned the people. It's a time that we have been summoned. Thank you, our God and our Father. In Jesus' name, we prayed. She talked about the land and the locusts. And Lord, COVID divided the land, and there were locusts divided us. There were physical locusts, you remember, but this locust of COVID, it divided us of people. We've lost loved ones. We did lose loved ones. We cried as a church. We cried as community. And so establishing a community altar means a lot to us. And we could see the joy of a community altar during that time. You called on people. They prayed with you. You called what is effective in a community altar is communication also. Because doctor talked about it. When you are together in one accord. So let's pray for oneness. Father God, we thank you for what your servant said. We need to be a community who is able to be in one accord, just like they were in Kikaya, that Lord, when they agreed on something, we pray that we shall be in agreement in many things that we do as a family. We pray for understanding in family, and obedience, oh Lord, we pray that when we take on something as a family, that Lord, when we say we are building, we shall build. When we say we are going to do this, we shall do it. Thank you, our God, for the testimony of Kikaya, and we thank you for the testimonies that even it will go to our families and our communities, and it begins at the family level. Thank you, our God and our Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. I want to revert to the burden. The burden. I think that is, for me, that, is the, that one was my, if there is anything I will forget, I will not forget the burden. We need a burden. The burden begins from you. Then tell it to your, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your children, and say there is this problem. There is this issue. And when you come from home, you come to church and say there is this issue. We need to pray about corruption. Okay, we need to pray about corruption. How about the drinking places? Eh, you guys, the drinking places. I remember there is a time we closed all drinking places on Lumumba Avenue. That year we closed them. But recently, the drinking places have, again, mushroomed. There is one who shares with us the airwaves here. They are there shouting on the other side, Smokies, and we are also here. So some of those places, all of them should close because it is important that we pray and the children don't get addicted to drinking. So the burden now is alcohol is a no-go zone. Whether breweries closes, whether Nile breweries closes, tax, we shall pay taxes. Well, Nile breweries and Uganda breweries, we close them. Jobs, we shall be having jobs. Burden. 
because most of the issues we are dealing with family, alcohol has been a very highest contributor. So this burden, we need to know what are the root causes. So let's pray. Our God and our Father, we want to pray, particularly for drinking places, that Lord, some of these places are not for good choice food. And we pray that Lord, you shut them, because Lord, the family is at, at stake. Lord, there is when we have passed uh, on Akash Avenue coming to pray on, on Sunday morning and people are staggering on the road at 7 o'clock. So, Lord, it does not glorify your name. So, Lord, we declare and decree that this is a burden to us in this city. And you gave us this city. And this city is where we are. And this city belongs to us. And so, because it belongs to us, we are burdened that there is a lot of alcoholism. And that's why there is that in the city. And that's why there is divorce. And so, Lord, we ask that you clean up the city and help the angels to come and help us in this assignment. Thank you, our God and our Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Nehemiah, Ezra made the people, when Ezra was reading this particular issue, the people were weeping. It is important to weep when there is a burden. So let's, let's, let's pray and, and ask ourselves that even as doctors finished, but we take this thing, this burden home and pray. Our God and our Father, we pray for ourselves, those online, those here, and those who will hear the message that Dr. Joyce has spoken about after, that, Lord, we shall carry this home and have a burden and pray through for our community altars to be established on good foundation. We bless you, O Lord. We magnify your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed.